First thing I want to just do, what I forgot to show you, I don't know how exciting this is, but <laughs> this is a ticker tape. <laughs> um, and uh, they weren't brown. This tape is about a half century old. Uh, it came from the attic of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, when I was at a conference there a year ago, I mentioned to um, the vice president there that I told my class about ticker tape machines, and, and they'd never heard of them. Didn't know what they were. Well, at least some of them hadn't. So he sent me this. This is never used, uh, but normally it would go into a machine and it would print out stock prices at trades. Um, but then I, I was I, I was giving a talk uh, yesterday at the New York Stock Exchange. I met him again and I said, "Thank you for this." <laughs> my, my class was happy to see it, and he said, "Well, I could have given you a whole ticker tape machine." <laughs> he said. Well, he said, well, the attic at the New York Stock Exchange was filled with them, but they finally threw them out, so it's too late. Um, but I think it is, it, this is evidence that, um, that uh, information technology really has dominated stock prices. Uh, we didn't really have active stock markets before the electronic age, which is an interesting thing to think about, because the ticker tape machine was invented by Edison in 1867. And in 1867, there were hardly any, there, there were stock markets, but they were very small. It was really the electronic communications that made it what it is. Um, and uh, it's exciting to think about the future and where electronic communications is going to take markets uh, going forward. Uh, so I wanted to uh, uh, continue today about uh, uh, futures markets. Uh, let me just step back and think. Uh, what is a futures market? Uh, today I'm going to talk about how it has expanded to cover uh, lots of other things, notably financial, financial instruments. But let's just think, what is a futures market? And the, um, the w uh, if you read Holbrook Working, who's on your reading list, uh, in his old half-century-old paper back in these days <laughs> he was writing, um, he says that the name futures is a bit misleading because that suggests that it's talking about the future rather than today. But if you listen to the news about any commodity price, uh, it's always talking about futures price. They don't talk about the price today. Uh, and uh, the futures price is the interesting. And the point that wor working made is not so much that it's in the future, is that it's well defined and standardized. Uh, it, it's on a so for agricultural futures, uh, it's true that the contract doesn't mature for a month or so, but uh, as Working points out, you know any contract for delivery of something has some term. They don't deliver it instantly, and Working says there are times when the so-called spot price is actually further in the future than the futures price. Uh, and so, if you look at the way things are traded, for I, I'm going to be talking a lot about oil, but let me just talk generally about oil. What is the price of oil? And how does anybody know what it is? If you go to people who buy and sell oil, they will tell you, well, we don't just sell oil, you know, we don't just have it ready to go. Uh, almost all of the oil is sold in long term contracts. So an oil company will sell a contract to deliver regularly to some uh, refinery uh, oil. They will have these tankers appear, uh, and we sign a, you know, a five year contract or whatever. Uh, and it has all kinds of terms. If you read the contract, it'd be 50 pages long, and it would specify all kinds of what we'll do if we don't deliver, you know, what happens if we can't deliver the grade we promised, um, and you know, lots of uncertainties are defined. So who knows what the price of oil is when it's being part of a long-term contract? So that's why you need a futures market, and the futures market is is the market uh, that's free of. It has a standardized contract. And so the, we know exactly what the price means, and, and attention <coughs> focuses on the futures market because the trade there is um, everybody understands it. it. Everyone knows exactly what's being traded, and the minute-to-minute -minute changes reflect something. They reflect something real, namely the change in the market, not any change in what's being delivered. So, uh, uh, so anyway, it used to be that. The only futures markets were for commodities, um, for things, 
Typically, it was thought that futures markets are good to have for things that are not standardized, that are difficult to define. So we want rice futures and we want wheat futures because there's so many different kinds of rice in different areas and different, and so uh, we want to have a standardized price. Uh, and so uh, there were no financial futures until the 1970s, and people uh, felt back then that we don't need futures contracts because uh, there's a standardization of of shares. Every share uh, in a given company is exactly identical, right? When, when you say, I'd like to buy 100 shares of a company, uh, you're not going to ask the broker, well, which shares did I get and can I look at them? The broker would say in disbelief, look, you've got shares. <laughs> They're all absolutely identical. Uh, and so you might think there's no need for a futures market uh, because it's, uh, the prices are already standardized in the cash market. Moreover, the prices that you see traded on the on the, on the stock exchange floor, you know exactly when the trade took place. They're not future traded. So why did we get futures markets? Um, well, let, let me come back to that. Let me just first, why did we get stock futures markets? But let me come back to that and talk about, just let's be clear what, what they are. Uh, stock index futures markets came in around 1980. Uh, and uh, one of the very first was the Standard & Poor 500 stock index futures market traded at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Uh, it, it was a radical innovation when it came in uh, because people thought, what's the point? <laughs> you know, I can see farmers delivering their corn uh, or their um, oats or whatever, but stocks, what's the point? Well, it turned out to be absolutely right because uh, the, C the CME was absolutely right to create this market because within a few years, there was more trade on the futures market than there was on the stock market itself. So let's be clear what they created. And th this is the terms of the contract as it is today. The S&P 500 is an index of stock prices produced by Standard & Poor's Corporation. Uh, and it's, they take the prices of 500 stocks and they form a weighted average. It's an arithmetic average uh, where the weights correspond to the amounts outstanding of the various stocks. So it's a value-weighted index. It's just a number published by the uh, uh, American Stock Exchange, uh, <laughs> by Standard & Poor, I'm sorry. Uh, and all it is, at, um, just as with um, agricultural futures, I, I don't know how clear I was about this yesterday. If you, maybe I didn't say this. <laughs> Let me say that applies both to agricultural futures and financial futures. If you want to trade in the futures market, you have to put up margin, okay? Uh, and there's a margin requirement for each contract. The margin is there to eliminate counterparty risk. With other contracts, when you sign a contract with another person, uh, you have to worry whether that person will come through. But with the exchange, it's, uh, that counterparty risk is eliminated. And the way the exchange eliminates it is it takes the other side itself of every contract. So it stands between you and the counterparty. And it protects itself by demanding margin. So you uh, have to upfront put up margin for any futures contract, and and the margin is settled daily. Every day, they look at your margin account, and they adjust it. Okay, so if uh, let me go back to wheat futures because it, that's the simpler. I, I don't think I really explained this well. If you buy, w when we say buy wheat futures, what does that mean? That means, it's the word buy or sell has a different meaning in futures markets. When you buy wheat futures, or for that matter, S&P 500 futures, it means that you put up margin. You did not pay the price for the contract. You only paid margin, which might be 5% or less than the price. Okay? So if, it's, uh, I, uh, if you're buying wheat futures, what are you doing? You're putting up margin. and standing ready to see your margin account credited or debited 
depending on the change in the futures price from day to day. So if the price of wheat in the futures market goes up and you bought futures, they will increase your margin account by the amount that it went up. And if the price of wheat goes down, they will decrease your margin account balance by that amount. How do they get the money? Well, that's because for every buyer, there's a seller in the futures market. So somebody else sold futures. Both of you put up margin. If you are buying, you put up margin. If you are selling, you put up margin. And so the result is that they have a place to get the money. <laughs> so if the price goes up and you bought, your margin account will go up. The exchange will get the money by taking it from the margin account of the guy who sold. And they've always fixed it so that the number of buyers always equals the number of sellers. Okay, so you see how the exchange can't lose, and you can't lose. This is a guaranteed thing. Um, the only problem is that what if uh, a margin account runs dry? Okay, so uh, both buyer and seller have put up margin, and then the price, let's say the price drops a lot, the futures price drops a lot, then that means that the, uh, the, the uh, the buyer's margin account is wiped out. What will happen then is that the futures commission merchant will go to the person who bought the futures and say, do you want to post more margin or do you want me to close you out? Okay, uh, And uh, that person has a decision to make. Uh, and if he or she puts up more margin, then that replenishes the margin account and the person can keep trading. That's, that's how the exchanges eliminate counterparty risk, by daily resettlement of the contracts. All right? So it's an invention. Actually, it goes back to Japan, although it's slightly different in form. It's an invention that eliminates any risk of the counterparty not performing, so that risk doesn't affect price. So it's the same. Uh, are, you, are you clear on that now, how the margin account works? You might not enjoy this. It, this uh, depends on how how much of a gambling instinct you have or how much fun this is. If you buy or sell futures, you can expect a phone call from your broker s sooner or later. Well, not necessarily, unless you have incredibly good luck. Um, so uh, Hillary Clinton, when she invested in the futures market, uh, she had incredibly good luck. You know this story? <laughs> uh, when, when her husband, uh, Bill Clinton, was governor, uh, she um, got a call from a, re a friend recommended to her a very good broker who knew how to trade in, in commodity futures. And so she put up something like $1,000 uh, of her own money. Uh, and then the, um, the, the broker kept calling her and asking her what she wanted to do. Um, and you know, she just never lost anything. She turned it into $100,000 uh, within uh, a year. Uh, and then she stopped. And we don't know why. I'm not, I'm not anti Hillary Clinton. This is just a futures market story. <laughs> I like her a lot. But what do you think happened there? Her margin account just kept going up and up and up. I mean, it went up amazingly. So you could conclude that she is a brilliant trader and she ought to be president of the United States. But then the next question is why did she stop? <laughs> why did she run it for a, a hundredfold increase and stop? Does anyone have any idea? What, is this common knowledge, this story? Well, the story ends there. Nobody knows what happened. Uh, futures traders are, are willing to exercise a guess of what happened. Does anyone have any guess what, 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 what do you think happened? Well, uh, I shouldn't say things so political. I do like Hillary Clinton. <laughs> what likely happened is some futures commission merchant was thinking of bribing the governor. Uh, maybe he didn't, you know, never actually did it. But you know, let's do a little favor for his wife, and then maybe I can, uh, maybe I can uh, ask him for something later. And so the futures merchant just didn't listen carefully to what she said. He just, well, he sort of cooked the books <laughs> and gave her money by uh, making it look like a trade. Uh, and when she found out, what what finally likely happened is someone said, "Do you think you're making so much money in the futures market?" Remember who your husband is, and this guy. Do you trust him? So she. Uh, this is a likely guess. She finally wondered, 
what is going on here? And she stopped because she didn't know what was happening either. Somehow money was coming in. And uh, see, that's the very. Now, maybe she was just very sa savvy <laughs> in her investing ability. But usually, your futures accounts go both up and down, and you get margin calls. Uh, so, uh, uh, anyway, the last day of the contract, there's a settlement. And, and it, it, well, in agricultural futures, the last day there's delivery. If you're still in the contract, if you are a seller on the last day, you must deliver the specified number of barrels or bushes, bushels of whatever it is. Or if you are a buyer, you must take delivery of them. But with stock futures, it's different because nobody expects you to deliver shares of stock. So what happens on the last day is there's a final settlement, uh, and that is in, in dollars in this case, 250 times the S&P 500 index at the on the last day, minus the futures price uh, of the preceding day, and that's the settlement. Uh, of course, you have been gaining the changes in the futures prices. Every preceding day, if you, th this is what you receive as a buyer, if you bought the contract, and this is what you pay if you sold the contract. All right, and so um, uh, every day between the time you originally bought, you've been getting, if you were a buyer, the change in the futures price, and at the end you get this. If you sum all those up, all the settlements you got since you bought the contract. Until the expiration of the contract, you would be getting the index at time t minus the futures when you bought. Okay, and so that that defines it, right? Every day you get the change in the futures price. Those all add up into your margin account, and on the last day you get this. <coughs> so what is it really you're doing? If you you could say, and they wouldn't like to put it this way at the ex futures exchanges. They don't like gambling analogies, but I make ga gambling analog analogies freely <laughs> in this course. It's like placing a bet on the, f on the <coughs> stock market. If you think the stock market is going to go up, you buy the futures. And if you think it's going to go down, you sell the futures. If you buy one contract, how much money do you get? You get, in total, over the total interval between the purchase date and the expiration <coughs> of the contract, you get the stock index. Minus the initial futures price you paid, times two hundred and fifty dollars. Okay, and that's that's the gamble. And if you sell, it's just exactly the opposite. So, uh, and so uh, now there's something called fair value, and you'll see this talked about a lot in the futures. This is what the futures price should be. Okay, uh, and we talked about it in terms of wheat. Remember, the fair value of a wheat futures was equal to the price of wheat today times 1 <coughs> plus the interest rate plus the storage cost. That was the formula we had last time, right? And that was the <coughs> fair value because we concluded that somebody who's storing grain has to make their expenses. They have to make the interest cost and they have to make the storage cost. So the, the futures price should be equal to fair value. It's the same here with stock index futures. The fair value F of a futures contract is equal to the stock price uh, plus the stock price times the interest rate plus the storage cost. And the storage cost for stocks is negative because it doesn't cost you anything to store a stock. We well, don't even have to store certificates anymore. The, your name will be held electronically. It's negative because you get dividends, okay? And so, why is the dividend yield that you get on the stock? So R minus Y uh, is the adjustment you have to make. But you see, this is to get from st stock price to fair value. You see, this is the same formula that we had for wheat, except that you understand that storage costs for stocks are negative because they pay a dividend. So all I've done is I've the way I wrote it before was P times one plus R plus S in, in, in the pre preceding lecture. 
Now it's p times 1 plus r minus y, because s equals minus y. But that is, that's the fair value uh, of, uh, of a stock index futures. And uh, now, we said last time that sometimes prices deviate from fair value, uh, or maybe they don't, depending on how you define fair value. But if you define fair value as 1 plus r plus s, where s is just the cost of a warehouse, then sometimes that formula doesn't work because uh, we talked about last time, at the end of the growing season, nobody is storing wheat anymore. Uh, and so the, the, the wheat market falls into backwardation, and the futures price gets low. Okay? Uh, uh, but uh, other than that, what, so normally wheat is being stored, and so normally wheat prices uh, are essentially equal to fair value. But stocks are always being stored. So there's, there's no, uh, it would be unusual to see backwardation in this market. It would be uh, abnormal. Because we're always storing stocks, that's what we do with them, is we hold them. Dividend yield, uh, well you can have backwardation, however, if the dividend yield is greater than the interest rate, because then the adjustment would make the futures price below the cash price. All right. Otherwise, you can't have backwardation in this market. So price should always equal fair value. Uh, uh, so um, right now, <coughs> we're in an unusual circumstance where the interest rate and the dividend yield are about the same. Right now, the Fed has cut short-term interest rates at federal funds rate to two and a quarter percent. That's very close to the dividend yield on the S&P 500. So at this point of time, the futures price is very close to the spot price. And so we fair value calculations are relatively unimportant. All right, are there any questions? Do you understand this? I have a, a, a clipping from, I took it from uh, yeah, yesterday's Wall Street Journal. Uh, and this is to prove that the Wall Street Journal is still publishing financial data, even though uh, uh, they've cut way back. Uh, this used to be a longer entry, but this is uh, what they have uh, as of yesterday. So uh, now this says the Standard and Poor 500. This is under uh, futures prices, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and they're reminding you that the settlement is 250 times the index, and they show two contracts: one expiring in June, and one expiring in December. Okay. And these are the prices. This is the opening price uh, at the beginning of the day. This is the highest price for the day that the contracts traded. And this is the lowest <coughs> price for traded at the day. And this is the settled price, which is essentially the last price of the day. Uh, okay, and this is the change in the settle from the preceding day. Uh, and this is the open interest. It's 550,000 contracts. Do you understand wh what all this means? Uh, so if you uh, now, I interesting. It looks like there's backwardation because the December futures at open is lower than the June futures. But I, I think this must be. It's not much lower. I think um, it, it may have something to do with timing of the trades. But if you look at the settle price over here, they are almost exactly identical between June and December. Uh, and the, there is. It's not backwardation. It's contango. The futures price is above the. Uh, it's going up as the horizon goes out. So, um, uh, uh, that, uh, that's where we are today. And they're talking an awful lot about futures, stock index futures. Uh, and so, if you, if you watch CNBC, they're always talking about it. Uh, and uh, the reason is, is that it's such a big and liquid market. In fact, the futures market, the S&P futures market, as I said, it's gotten bigger than the, S than the stock market itself, at least at certain times. Uh, it's also just a more trustworthy number, uh, and it's, it moves faster. So it's, it's gotten very, um, a, a great deal of attention. Why does the futures market move so fast, and why is it uh, such a popular instrument? Uh, I think the, the main reason is that 
it is a market that uh, it's like a wholesale market for antiques rather than the uh, local antique dealer. Okay, so if you went to an antique dealer in New Haven to try to buy some furniture for your apartment, uh, who knows what price you'd get, right? It would be very erratic. Uh, and you'd be dealing one on one with the dealer. Well, that's what happens in the futures, in the, in the stock market as well. Uh, so uh, remember, I was telling you that a dealer has to have a bid ask spread, uh, an ag antique dealer? They, 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 they'll buy the chest of drawers at a lower price than they'll sell it. And the difference between bid and ask is their bid ask spread, and that's their profit. Uh, dealers have to keep a wide bid ask spread because they have a lot of expenses, and they have the risk of, of being ripped off by more knowledgeable people who really know antiques and will buy their best stuff and leave behind the junk. And because they're constantly exposed to this risk, antique dealers keep wide bid ask spreads. Uh, so it's the same with the stock market. The people, the specialist or the uh, dealers who trade on the stock market uh, with customers have the same concerns, so they keep relatively wide bid ask spreads. But in the futures market, there's I it's cleaner. <laughs> there's a huge volume of trade. It's very competitive, and there's less fear about being ripped off by someone who has special knowledge because who knows what this index is going to do anyway. So dealers have narrow bid ask spreads in the futures market. All right, and, and as a result, the futures market is where the action is. Uh, and so the people who doubted that back in 1980, who doubted that financial futures would ever take off, were really wrong. Even though stocks are perfectly standardized, every share is the same as every other share, the, uh, we do need a futures market. Uh, and so the futures market uh, is, is very important. Uh, anyway, I wanted to talk about oil. Is there any questions about oil, about stock futures? I went through it kind of quickly. Uh, but it, it is a. Um, the, the important thing, though, is just to understand fair value. It's actually a very simple market to understand. Once you know this formula, you pretty much know the price for any future date. Remember, the R, again, as in the preceding lecture, is not the annual interest rate unless we're talking about a contract. That matures in one year. Uh, it's the interest between now and and uh, expiration date. Okay. Uh, and the same thing with dividends. This is the dividend yield. Well, we're not talking about annual dividend yield, but the dividends as a fraction of the price between now and maturity of the contract. And so that's the only formula uh, that we really need. Uh, so to think of it, the, the stock index futures market is where you really look to see where the stock market is moving. It's faster than the stock price index itself that the S&P publishes. The S&P 500 is a little bit behind the thing that's trading on. And why is that? Well, it's because some of the stocks in the S&P 500 index don't trade r r really minute by minute with the same speed that you'd think. Uh, and, uh, and so the S&P 500 is always catching up on itself, the actual index. But this market has all the smartest traders trading it, and they kind of know when the S&P 500 is lagging. And so they, they immediately correct it in the futures price. So the futures price is the place to look for what the stock market is really doing. Um, all right, I'll, I'll move to oil futures, which is a, a matter of great uh, interest right now because of the turmoil in the oil market. Uh, and oil futures actually go back, uh, they're not so old either uh, compared to wheat or corn. They developed in the early 1980s. Um, do I have. Uh, so <coughs> this is the uh, NYMEX oil uh, futures market. Uh, and. Um, there are many futures markets for oil, but the NYMEX is the most important one. And they are trading. This is different. It's a physical delivery oil uh, futures market, L no different from the agricultural futures. 
So uh, the, they define a particular grade of oil, and uh, they call it light, sweet, crude oil. Uh, sweet oil is better than sour oil. Uh, I wouldn't try tasting it, but <laughs> uh, the refiners like it better, uh, generally. Uh, and so it's a grade of oil, or it's also called West Texas Intermediate. Uh, and you have to, if you, if you buy a contract and you hold it to maturity, you are uh, going to have to take delivery of 1,000 barrels of light, sweet, crude oil uh, in Cushing, Oklahoma. And they picked Cushing, Oklahoma as kind of central to the country. So you can call your broker and buy a contract today, uh, and then uh, you could get the May contract, uh, and then in May you'd have to take a trip down to Cushing <laughs> and get your 1,000 barrels. Uh, or you could sell in the futures market, uh, and that would mean that you would, have you would be promising to deliver 1,000 barrels. As I said last time, Almost nobody who trades these contracts actually takes delivery or makes uh, delivery, uh, because almost everyone closes out their contract before that. Uh, but um, so, uh, uh, but it's the same idea as all these other oil contracts. Uh, so you uh, uh, you have contracts maturing in each month. There's one. We're already we've already passed the expiration of the April contract, uh, so it's May, June, July, August, etc. Uh, and uh, this is the price. Uh, these are at, uh, well actually the they make a distinction between last and settle. The settled price is the important price because that determines the uh, changes in your margin account. So the uh, settled price uh, as of yesterday. Reached $113.44 per barrel, uh, which is a uh, record high. Uh, uh, and you can see th th uh, that as delivery dates go out, the uh, settled price goes down. So the oil market is currently in backwardation. All right? Now, remember what we said about futures is that. Normally, they're in contango. Remember, the futures price, fair value, tends to equal the price today times 1 plus the interest rate plus storage costs. Okay? Storage costs for oil are substantial. This is a thick, bulky commodity. You've got to have one of those storage tanks. You see them out there in New Haven Harbor. They cost money. Uh, it's expensive to store. So storage costs are not negligible for oil. Plus, interest rates are positive. So we would think that oil should have contango normally. Its price should be going up. But very frequently, oil is not in contango, and right now it is not. You can see that oil prices are lower in by October, according to the futures market. Uh, and so I wanted to reflect a little bit on uh, what oil, uh, what what uh, is going on in the oil market. Um, and the thing you have to understand, so in, in terms of oil, you understand the contract. It's exactly the same as a wheat contract. It's just a contract to deliver 1,000 barrels uh, or receive it. And if you do that, you, you don't have to come up with oil today. <laughs> you probably never come up with oil. You have to come up with margin today. And your margin account will reflect the change in oil prices. This is the number you see in the newspaper. This is when they talk about the price of oil in the newspaper. This is it. Uh, there's also something called Platts, which is a company that uh, I guess it's a McGraw Hill company that that does cash prices of oil, but uh, it's um, it's not quoted as much because I don't think it's as reliable as this. Uh, the problem with um, with uh, uh, you might say this is a month in the future. Uh, isn't that a f that's not today's price, but that's what people are quoting as today's price uh, because it's the most accurate price. Uh, and so now, why is it going into uh, backwardation? Uh, so I, w I wanted to think about storage of oil because we were saying that everything should be generally in contango, uh, 
isn't, aren't they storing oil? As I said, if you drive out to New Haven Harbor, you see all these storage tanks. And don't they have oil in them? Uh, uh, and so I wanted to think a little bit about where the oil is. Most of the oil is still in the ground uh, in, uh, you know, in the Persian Gulf and in uh, Mexico and Russia and all places. But we don't count that as storage of oil because it has to be extracted. And it's not just there for uh, sale. There's a, there's a lag. So we have to consider oil that's above ground and ready to go. Uh, and so it is stored, and it's stored here in New Haven. Uh, in fact, the government of the United States has created what they call a strategic petroleum reserve. And it has taken oil and it's storing it in caverns, in caves. And this is in case of a national emergency where we suddenly really need oil. Uh, but that isn't going to affect this market because it's being held by the government for some war or some terrible event, and it's not on the market. So that doesn't affect uh, uh, the. Even though the market is in backwardation, the government is not going to sell off this oil. Uh, so it's not affecting the market. The other thing uh, that's happened is there's a heating oil reserve. And this was created by uh, President Clinton uh, uh, in, uh, in the year 2000. And that is actually in two places it's in New York and New Haven. So we, we are the storage place for heating oil. Uh, and this is not a strategic petroleum reserve, but it's a reserve that the government can use to stabilize the heating oil market. They were concerned about spikes in heating oil affecting people who are in difficult economic circumstances. So that reserve um, could, uh, could ultimately affect the market if the government chooses to sell it off. Um, but they only have two million barrels, so it's not big. I think the first thing to recognize about the oil market is that there isn't much storage compared to the uh, flow through. Basically, what we have in oil is we have those wells all over the world pumping oil. They put it into tankers. The tankers take it across the ocean to various countries where it goes into temporary storage at harbors, but it doesn't stay there long. It keeps flowing through. Then it puts put on oil trucks and it's driven, it's driven to refineries and then. Uh, it end, ends up in gas stations. Uh, so uh, there's not a lot of oil in storage. And so that's why the oil market is very often in backwardation, because the price of oil reflects the temporary scarcities of oil. Uh, and if there's any shortage of oil, if something happens, then uh, the oil price can jump up. Uh, and everybody knows it's going to come back down. And so so you can have backwardation. Basically, you don't have uh, people selling off their stores when there's a backwardation, like we talked about last time. It's not like at the end of the harvest, people know whom, uh, when the w wheat harvest is coming in, people know that wheat prices should go down and they sell off their stores. It's not like that here. Uh, the stores that we have of oil are, have a convenience yield, uh, and so they're, they're, it's. Uh, something that doesn't, uh, the backwardation doesn't quickly correct itself. So I think that what this means here, this backwardation in the oil market, is that people think that oils have spiked up, there's a temporary shortage, and that prices are going to come down somewhat. Although not a whole lot here. Um, uh, this is uh, 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 the futures term structure. I have it plotted for a number of years. Uh, and I should have made this a little bigger. It's a little hard to read. Uh, but this is today. Uh, so what this is is for uh, all of these are from today's uh, news all on this top line. And what it shows is for every maturity out to six years what the futures price is. So right now we're at $114 a barrel, uh, but the market is predicting a decline. Not a whole a huge decline, but back to something like $108 a barrel in six years. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, the m futures market has often been predicting either increases or declines. And you can look at different times in history. Uh, particular interest here, I have ca Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and um, <laughs> I can't. 
uh, right, this is December. This is Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and so uh, right after the hurricane, uh, in, um, in uh, August of 2005, the hurricane destroyed some of our refining capability and some of our storage uh, tanks uh, because uh, New Orleans is an oil center where tankers come and they go, they go up the Mississippi River. Uh, and so we destroyed uh, the hurricane destroyed a part of our infrastructure. So everybody in the market knew that that means that oil prices are temporarily high. And so you can see the, the backwardation in the market. But we see even more backwardation right today. So that, that's, that's an indication that uh, there's something going on in the short run in our market, if you believe the market. Um, what do I have? I have here, this goes way back. This one is 1990. And you notice it stops after 18 months. That's because in 1990, the futures market wasn't as developed as it is now. It only went out 18 months. But you can see there was strong backwardation. Uh, this was uh, when Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait. Uh, and uh, it caused a tremendous disruption of oil supply. And everybody knew that's temporary. And so the futures price were lower. That was about the most backwardated futures market we've seen in oil. Uh, today it's pretty backwardated, so but not so not as dramatically percentage-wise as it was after Katrina. Um, this is a plot of uh, oil prices uh, in the United States. This is West Texas Intermediate. Uh, well, actually, I'm not sure it's all the way back is West Texas. No, it's not <laughs> all the way back because Texas oil wasn't discovered until around 1900, I think. I'm not sure about that date exactly. This is Pennsylvania oil back here. I've got it going way back. <laughs> uh, but the interesting thing about this, uh, this is of interest uh, at the moment, that oil prices now are higher than they've ever been. And this is in real terms, uh, real inflation corrected terms. Uh, so, very interesting what this means for our lives. Uh, just 10 years ago, oil was at a record low. Uh, uh, that, uh, we were uh, like, uh, a little over $10 a barrel. So what is going on here? We've seen the oil price jump up something uh, close to tenfold in 10 years. Uh, it's a huge surprise. Uh, so, uh, but uh, there are other surprises. One thing I wanted to do was to go through um, um, just a few. Um, uh, let's see, where am I going to go here? Uh, go through a few stories about oil prices here. I, I, this was a period when oil was stable, generally very stable uh, in the post-World War II period. Uh, there was a Texas Railroad Commission that was stabilizing oil prices. At that time, the U.S. was not a big importer of oil. We had our own oil supply, and uh, we, uh, we tended to, uh, uh, we, we had a sort of a monopoly that tried to stabilize the price. And they were pretty successful for this long time period. The huge shock came, and this is called the first oil shock. And that was in 1973-74. Uh, oil went up. Uh, it went up like more than doubled, right? That's like almost three times increase in oil price all of a sudden. Uh, and that was associated with a uh, with a particular, it's called the first oil crisis, uh, and it, it uh, coincides with the Yom Kippur War uh, between Israel and her Arab neighbors, uh, and it caused a, uh, I Israel quickly triumphed in that war, uh, but it left a lot of bad feelings among the surrounding Arab, Arab countries who were sympathetic with the Palestinian cause. And so they, um, cut back on their oil production. We have uh, a, a, uh, an organization called OPEC. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, I don't know if you can see this, OPEC. That's the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. And it was established in 1960 uh, with a small number of Arab countries. But they've gra gradually grown and have more and more, uh, more and more 
uh, uh, countries that are members. So it was OPEC that constra constrained the supply of oil for the first oil crisis. This is the second oil crisis here, and that was um, in 1979-80. Um, and this, again, had its origin, uh, or at least the common story, and there must be some truth to this story. It had its origin in another crisis in the Middle East, uh, and that was the war between Iraq and Iran. Uh, and so uh, uh, th there was an uh, Iranian revolution in 1979 with, where the Shah of Iran was thrown out and the Ayatollah Khomeini came in. And Iraq used this as an opportunity to try to grab some oil from uh, Iran. This war completely disrupted oil supplies, and we had this huge spike in oil prices then. Uh, and uh, a lot of these spikes seem to have political causes. This spike in the oil price is caused by the 1991 uh, invasion <coughs> of the uh, uh, well, the United States was the primary invader of Iraq. Uh, this was after September 11th, uh, and this uh, uh, disrupted oil supplies again. All these times were uh, periods of backwardation in the oil market because people saw them as crises that was limiting the supply of oil for now, but would eventually uh, correct itself. Um, uh, so, uh, so what's happening now? <laughs> this is just an amazing spike of oil right now. There isn't, I mean, we have this uh, war in Iraq, but it's not a sudden, intense thing that uh, it's not disrupting oil supplies. Uh, so why are we seeing this huge spike in oil? Uh, and that is an interesting question. Part of it has to do with the fact that we have a rapidly growing <coughs> world economy, and developing countries are moving forward faster than was anticipated. So there's a lot of demand for oil from India, China, and other de rapidly developing countries. Um, so uh, they say that. Uh, China uh, builds a new city the size of Houston, Texas every month. <laughs> so, uh, uh, they're consuming an awful lot of energy to do this. Um, the other side of it is that uh, discoveries of oil have been disappointing. So I was just down in Mexico, uh, and the president, Calderon, uh, is talking about privatizing the Mexican oil, or at least part of it, uh, oil industry. Because they've been disappointing uh, in their exploration. They're, they're not finding oil. So the reserves that Mexico has has been actually declining rapidly. Um, and um, th oh, this brings up another thing about the ownership of oil. I just wanted to mention uh, nationalization. Uh, it used to be that uh, most of the oil in the world was owned by private uh, companies or individuals. But uh, Nationalization began in 1938 in Mexico, where a um, left-leaning government defined, uh, decided that all the oil, uh, Mexican oil that was owned by foreigners, really belonged to the Mexican people, uh, and so uh, the Mexican government just said it's ours. That was an outrageous uh, thing to say then, but uh, it was greeted by shock. Uh, by international uh, law, uh, they just took the oil in their country, saying that it wasn't fair the way it was sold. Uh, it was followed up by, in 1951 uh, by Iran, and, and other countries followed as well. Um, but now we're seeing a reverse. So Mexico nationalized its oil in 1938, but now that the supply is dwindling, our, our President Calderon wants to reverse the process. This is controversial now. Uh, in, in yesterday's newspaper, I don't know if you read the Wall Street Journal, it had a story saying that uh, Russian, for the first quarter of 2008, Russian production of oil declined for the first time in 10 years. And there's worry now that Russia is running out of oil. So I think it's these, uh, th th this uh, impact of of news like this is having a psychological effect on the market, and it's causing a huge rubble. You might consider this a bubble in oil prices. 
uh, but I'm not so sure that it's a bubble. Uh, it's, um, it's certainly unprecedented. It seems like we're entering a period of great market volatility. We've seen an unprecedented bubble in home prices, uh, and now the economy is reeling from, this, from the effects of this uh, bubble. But look what's happening as well in oil prices. And once again, there's no war right now. There's nothing really dramatic. Uh, ha well, we do have, you know, you might, you, you could call it a war, but it's not something that has shut down the Persian Gulf uh, and closed off oil supplies. So it seems like it's something, uh, something more uh, uh, systemic. It's something more to do with the economic situation than before, or it's something speculative. Uh, and um, we have so we we have backwardation, but it's not a whole lot of backwardation. They're still predicting oil prices to come down to something like there, uh, like well over a hundred in, in eight years. So it's not uh, it's not a um, it's not something that's related to a particular crisis that uh, uh, that is going to end quickly. Uh, so I wanted to go on. Uh, oh, this is uh, this just uh, is a clipping I got from. Uh, this is the day that uh, Saddam Hussein announced an oil embargo. Uh, this was in his reaction to the United States uh, um, uh, pressure on him, uh, and so uh, oil prices spiked up. It, uh, it seemed dramatic when I made this clipping, <laughs> but. Now oil is a hundred dollars a barrel. You know that's just only that's only uh, what six years ago, but at that time people thought uh, the, the market thought that oil prices were coming back down by '03. They were really wrong. People didn't get it. All this time people thought that oil they they but you know a, a large part of the time it was in backwardation. They thought that there's some special event occurring. This is Saddam Hussein, uh, but it turns out that there was something driving it up. This is again. Oh, this is natural gas on that same date. This is still in contango because the prices are going up through time. So that kind of explains that if Saddam Hussein was selectively hitting on the oil market and not the natural gas market, uh, it explains those two markets. I want to talk briefly about other futures. There's a gold futures market, uh, and the gold futures market. Uh, this is a clipping, an old clipping I had of it. It's it's a very steady contango market. That's because gold is very different from oil. Gold is in storage. Uh, there's nothing to do with gold <laughs> except hold it. But you, you don't burn it. That's the difference. Oil, you burn it and it's gone. So we don't have much around, and we're we're always vulnerable to some supply interruption. But with gold, there's no supply interruption. We don't burn gold. It just sits there. Uh, we're holding this stuff. We don't know what to do with that. <laughs> uh, it can't really be in contango for very long because someone who's holding gold is going to say, hey, if it's going down in the futures market, I'm not going to sit on this stuff. I'm going to sell it. So it, it stays in, uh, did I say contango? If it's in backwardation, people would sell it. So it stays very nicely in contango. And it's going up at the rate of interest. The storage cost, uh, there's a storage cost as well, but I don't know how big that is for gold. I guess you'd have to pay uh, for a police force <laughs> to defend your gold, something like that. So it must have some storage costs. But um, it's a very simple market uh, because it uh, it stays in contango all the time. Copper futures. Now copper is different from gold because uh, it's not. This is a, oh, this is a 2004 clipping again. Copper is an industrial commodity that gets used up. And so it suffers from supply disruptions, and it, it can, uh, like oil, it can fall into backwardation. So here, uh, I should I should write these. Did I ever write these down? <laughs> Contango, just to make sure, is when futures prices are going up as the maturity with maturity, higher prices for more future dates, and backwardation is when it's going down. Okay, so uh, this is an example of a backward, backwardated market. 
the prices as we go out to further and further. This is 2004. When we go out to December of that year, it's down from 139 to 136. And when we go out to uh, December of the following year, it's down to 118. Uh, gold, by the way, has gone up a lot, too. <laughs> uh, there's been a lot of commodity price increases that surprise us. This is the federal funds future, another clipping. There's a futures market for the federal funds rate. Uh, and it's cash settled uh, because you can't uh, deliver federal <coughs> funds. The settlement, uh, uh, the, the price shown uh, is 100 minus the federal funds rate. Uh, and so uh, back then, in, uh, this is 2004, the federal funds rate was about 5%. So this is, uh, it looks like 5 and a quarter percent. Uh, and so uh, 100 minus 94.74 is five and a quarter percent. That's what the federal funds rate was expected to be uh, in March of 2004. Uh, and here uh, you see that the federal funds rate was expected to de continue to decline at that time. Um, this market can go either way because you don't store federal funds. So there's no fair value calculation like there are with the other markets. So uh, it reflects expectations of future interest rates. Um, right now, I, I, don't, I should have gotten today's, but I think the federal funds futures market is <coughs> predicting right now, with the federal funds rate at two and a quarter percent, the federal funds market, this would be 97.75 now, 100 minus two and a quarter, or be close to that. And it would be going down with time. People are expecting the Fed to cut interest rates. I'm sorry, going. These numbers would be going up. Uh, but I don't have the clipping for today. And I just finally wanted to talk about uh, home price futures, which is uh, an, a market that uh, I've gotten involved with creating uh, at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Uh, so I got involved with them because I have a price index. My colleague and I, Carl Case, who's a professor at Wellesley College, um, he and I, in the late 1980s, created a home price index. Uh, this was our research. I put it out as a working paper <laughs> here at Yale uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and, uh, but from the beginning, we thought that the real importance of having a home price index <coughs> is for trading. Uh, we live in a world where people don't trade. Uh, there's no <coughs> international market for real estate. Uh, and it's quite remarkable that there is not, because real estate is a huge in, uh, <coughs> asset class. Uh, the value of single-family homes in this country is about 30 percent bigger than the value of the stock market uh, in the U.S. Um, yet we see so much talk about the stock market. Uh, when we started in 1988, we realized not only was there no market for single-family homes, except the very, in the very local market, um, there was also no price index for single-family homes. Uh, you know, it's, it's just sometimes amazing how undeveloped things are. Here we are in the 20th century. Everything is computerized and all that. But you just want to just want to know what home prices have been doing in the United States. Uh, in the late 1980s, and you couldn't find out. Well, there were some indexes, but they were rather poor, uh, we thought, and so uh, and uh, not very reliable. So we we did our econometric work uh, and devised a method of uh, a repeat sales method of home price indexes. Uh, I wrote a book in 1993 about uh, called Macro Markets. About uh, it, it talked a lot about index number construction. And I said in the book that we need to devise a home price index that is as close as possible to something like the S&P 500, which is a stock price index. But the problem with home prices is we have a much bigger non-trading problem. Uh, uh, this, the the S&P 500 is not very out of date because stocks usually don't go untraded for more than a few minutes uh, or maybe a few hours at times. But with homes, the typical home doesn't trade every 10 years. And so we have a huge non-trading problem. So 
So what we did is we created an index that was as close as possible to a stock price index so that it could be traded on a, on a financial market. And then uh, I had a student here, uh, Alan Weiss, who uh, said, why don't we get going and get my student was graduate. He actually was an SOM student, MBA student, uh, and he said uh, he was he was graduating, and he thought we should produce these indexes for sa sale for use in financial markets, uh, and so he wanted to do it, and he set up our company, Case Schiller Weiss Incorporated, <laughs> and he ran it, and and now Case and I were just on the advisory. Well, we were on the board of directors, but we were just advising the operation. So my, I, I was so proud of him. <laughs> my student <laughs> created the Case Schiller Home Price Indexes, uh, and we started publishing them. Um, and then in 19, early 1990s, we traveled to all the futures markets and proposing to them that they create home price futures based on our indexes. Um, and uh, it was uh, disappointing. We couldn't get anyone to do it. Uh, I thought we had such a strong case. Shouldn't couldn't there be a market, a futures market? I w we, we went to the, uh, I mentioned the coffee, sugar, <coughs> cocoa exchange. We tried them all, right? So we go to these guys, and they're trading coffee and sugar and cocoa. And I said, look, you know, coffee is nice. I mean, everyone wants their cup in the morning. But we're talking about $20 trillion of unhedged risk. Most households in the United States, that's what they own, a typical household. They don't own much stock. They own real estate, and they can't hedge it. So we, we, t uh, we, I think we had the most progress with the Chicago Board of Trade. They actually uh, did some research with us. Uh, the funny thing that happened is CBOT did research in 1994 on whether they should set up a futures market for single-family homes, and the basic conclusion they made a lot of phone calls. That's how they did research, asking people, "Are you worried about your home price falling?" And would you like to be able to hedge the risk in the futures market, the way farmers do in the agricultural market? And basically, the answer was no. <laughs> People uh, said, uh, I don't worry about my home price falling. Uh, and so they didn't want to start a market because they thought. <coughs> but I was going around saying, don't you know? There's no law of economics saying home prices don't fall. They, did f they have fallen, they, fall they fell a lot in the Depression. Uh, and they could do it again, and so why don't people want to, you know, have a market that would? They don't, they don't just go steadily up, uh, but people said, "Well, the depression that was so long ago, we can't remember that," uh, and so we couldn't seem to get anyone focused on it. I, I think there's something that, uh, about this that uh, we learned about the origins of our current economic situation. Uh, so we went around to a lot of people. Trying to get them interested in hedging real estate price. Remember, the purpose of futures markets is not gambling; it's hedging. It's protecting yourself. I should write that term on the board as well. Hedging. Okay. I, I hope I made this clear. If you are running, let's go back to wheat. If you have a warehouse full of wheat, okay, you are a wheat warehouser, and you would like a stable business. So what do you do? Uh, you don't know what the price of wheat is going to do. It goes up and down internationally. So what do you do? You sell it in the futures market, and that means you've hedged your risk of wheat prices. If wheat prices go down, true, the value of the stuff in storage that you own is going to go down, but offsetting that is your futures contract price will go up, and that, th that hedging will protect you, and so you have reduced risk of your business, and this is done a lot. Well, Holbrook Working in the reading talks about that. So farmers also can hedge. They've got wheat growing in the fields, uh, and they're worried about the price they can sell it at. So let's lock it in today. Let's sell in the futures market. Uh, and the, the, uh, if the price of wheat declines, your short position in the futures market will appreciate and offset your loss. So you want to hedge your risk. So we went around asking people. Don't you want to hedge your risk in the real estate market? Uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately, people are rather confused about that, and they're not used to hedging that. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, with the recent boom in home prices, we were able. We we finally approached the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, 
in 2006 uh, and, uh, and uh, said, we want to work with you to create, try to create a futures market for single-family homes. Uh, and they said, okay, let's try it. And so this was uh, what we did. In May of 2006, we created a futures market. The f uh, the, uh, not the very first, there was an attempt in London in 1991 that failed, but we were essentially the first of a futures market for single family homes in the United States. Uh, and um, this market uh, has been in backwardation almost from the first day. When we opened the market in May of 2006, our market maker, uh, who was um, brought in by the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, thought, like everyone else who reads the newspapers, well, home prices just always go up. And so they, the, the market maker uh, put out a bid ask that implied contango in the market, that home prices would go up. But the, uh, the market maker quickly learned that there was no market, contango market. Uh, and he, uh, after losing uh, a huge amount of money, he pushed his bid ask spreads into the backwardation range and left it there ever since. And so this, is, this shows the backwardation in the futures market uh, recently. But it's been this way for a couple of years now. So what's going on in the housing market? I think that what has been happening is that newspapers and real estate agents and lots of uh, commentators, uh, people you see on the news, have been telling us that home prices always go up. They've never fallen. Uh, and uh, don't worry. <laughs> okay? So a lot of casual people have believed that. But the kind of people who trade in futures markets didn't believe it, even going back to early 2006. <coughs> people who are ready to put their money on the line have been predicting a decline in home prices now for two years. And you can see what dramatic declines are being predicted in our futures market. Uh, so I have it for various cities, Boston, Chicago, Denver. All, we have separate markets for each of, the ten of these 10 cities, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Miami, New York, San Diego, and San Francisco. So uh, the worst market of them all is Miami. Uh, and this market is predicting almost a 35% home price decline uh, by November of uh, 2012. Um, and the second worst, what is the second worst? I can't quite read it. They kind of merged here. There's a bunch of cities where the prediction is for a 20 to 25 percent drop. Um, and the best, the best city of all is Chicago, but even there they're predicting a 7 percent drop. So we've seen a lot of backwardation in that market. Uh, I think this is reflecting the, the unusual economic circumstance we're in. Uh, finally, this is my last slide. This shows the, uh, the, the S&P Case-Shiller Home Price Index. Uh, that line is the actual home price index. And it has these jumps in it every month. That's because it's a monthly index. So we only publish it every month. But you can see that it's been very smooth. It was increasing until around the time we started the futures market. Uh, and then it's been declining at an accelerating rate. So we are now down, in real terms, about 15%. Uh, nationwide uh, on home prices, uh, which peaked in uh, early 2006. This is the futures price that we've had, and that's for the closest futures contract, the nearest to expiration. And so uh, I, we were hoping to get a lot of publicity for this because we thought this is a very interesting number. This is a futures market price for homes, and it moves around day by day. You, all those little wiggles reflect new information that came in on, on a particular day. Uh, unfortunately, we have not been able to get much attention for this number, uh, but there's been a lot of attention to our, our the S&P Case-Shiller Home Price Indexes now. Uh, in fact, uh, we are getting uh, 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 newspaper stories all the time written about our indexes, but they don't write about our market. Uh, and so we've had trouble getting a futures market started. Uh, it's going, but it's going only at a low level. But I, I think that in the future, this will take off eventually. I, I think that we'll have futures markets for many more things. Uh, but eventually, we'll have a futures market for New Haven as well. Right now, New Haven is too small to warrant its own futures market. 
So I, I was thinking, well, someone in New Haven could just buy two, or if you wanted to hedge your house, you'd sell two New York contracts and one Boston contract. I'm sort of interpolating between New, New York and Boston. Uh, but eventually, we have to do better than that. Uh, and I th I'm hopeful that there will be a day in my lifetime when we'll see all cities of the world traded on futures market. And, and in my new book, Subprime Solution, I also, complain, I also claim, uh, I think I have some faith in, basis to say this, that it will help reduce bubbles and help reduce the kind of instability. Next period, we're going to talk about options. Uh, and then we have only one more lecture, uh, the last lecture on the democratization of uh, finance.